Morning, everyone. Great to have you joining us in worship this morning. I want to share a couple of announcements. Uh, we have some small groups we're starting in the month of November, and the one that has some remaining slots is the one for diamond painting. If you want to sign up, uh, Heather will be at the back table at the door if you'd like to do that. Uh, second announcement, Bruce Bayshore is very sick with COVID. He uh, went into intensive care yesterday, and we want to pray for him. Uh, Bob uh, Crawford decided, hey, maybe we can make some videos, um, video messages for Bruce, and maybe he will see them, maybe he won't, but if you would like to send a video message, he'll be in my office to record your message or prayer, or whatever you might do for Bruce to encourage him. Also at the back door, I noticed there was a paper for the Christmas Bazaar, and uh, you can volunteer for that. There's volunteer uh, opportunities there and ordering that you can do. Um, also want to mention, tonight is the pumpkin experience in the barn. I think it's from 5.30 to 8.30, and um, you can ride a hay wagon down and see these pumpkins. There's about 70 of them in the barn, and uh, it'll look cool. And uh, I'm glad it's over after today. But uh, it's cool. Thank you for all volunteering. And next Saturday, I need to put Christmas lights in the barn to set up so that people can do some decorating. So if you're interested in helping me decorate in the barn next Saturday, I'm going to start at 8 o'clock in the morning. This is putting lights above in the barn and putting lights around and decorating those trees that were in front of the, Christ uh, the barn last year. I could use some help for that. Otherwise, I'm, it's going to be a long day for me. So let me know if you're interested so I have an idea of how many people, and then if I don't have enough, I'll start begging. Um, and finally, we haven't had bulletins for a long time. Next Sunday, we'll start having bulletins again. But they're just going to be uh, the, the order of worship, order of worship, the calendar. In the beginning of November, December, we're going to start our newsletter again. And the newsletter is going to be the, the place where we're going to put the more comprehensive, long uh, announcements about different, different activities that are going to happen. So that's what's happening. Bulletins next week, newsletter. Uh, beginning of December, then maybe I can cut down the number of announcements I'm making up front here. So, having shared those things, let's begin with a word of prayer. Lord God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your love and your blessing. Um, we thank you for uh, the people that have enriched our lives. And this is a kind of memorial service day. Uh, some people might remember that, other people might not. But pictures have been submitted, and I'm going to read off some names at some point. And we grieve the loss of people that were near and dear to us. And we pray that you would comfort us today and help us to reflect on the legacy they've, that they've left in our lives. And we pray that you would help us to leave a legacy as well. We thank you for the love that we have found in Jesus. It gives us hope of a life beyond the grave. And we ask your anointing this time of worship. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Let's begin by singing hymn number 43, A Mighty Fortress is Our God.
Let's confess our sins together using the confession printed on the screen. Faithful Redeemer, you are the beginning and the ending of all things. You promise to wipe away every tear, that death and mourning will be no more. You make your home among us and abide with us as our God. Teach us to live as the saints you call us to be, that we may truly be your people, living and doing your will. In the name of Jesus, who is the Christ, amen. Let's pray together. Lord God, we thank you for your promises in the scripture where you promise to wipe away every tear from our eyes and that death and mourning will be no more, that there will be a day like that. And we confess that sometimes we struggle. We're so much in our despair that we struggle to believe, is this true? And why did this loss happen? We ask you to help us to overcome those times of weakness in even our faith and give us strength by the power of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for the comforting hope and your faithful love extended to us, no matter what the circumstance might be within our lives. In your name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Listen to the word of God. I'm reading from the uh, 28th chapter of Matthew, beginning at verse 16. Listen to the word of God. It says, Then the eleven disciples left for Galilee, going to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some of them doubted. Jesus came and told the disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach them. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I've given you. And be sure of this. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. This ends the reading of God's holy word. I appreciate people sending in pictures that we're going to include in the screen in just a few minutes. I, I just want to begin to set us up to think about those people that we're going to reflect on. And I want to begin by talking about the crazy year and a half, two years we've had. It's unlike any other. And uh, I can't tell you when it started hitting me, but at some point during the course of the past year, when I was doing funerals differently and meeting with families in a different way. I thought, this is just wrong. It's just not right. And uh, one of the funerals I had, had just three people here. <laughs> they, I think the casket was up front, unless it was a cremation. And I was standing here, and they were sitting, where uh, Sandy and uh, Charlotte are sitting, three people, and that's it. Now, the person may not have been well-known. I don't recall how old they were, but... Uh, just three people seem wrong to me. Uh, one of my memories and reflections of this year was when uh, Myers Adam was dying. And I see some of Myers' family here. And I, he, he died at uh, a nursing facility down in Boyertown. And I visited him numerous times. But by the time he died, I don't remember exactly when, April, May, uh, he, he couldn't, we couldn't visit him. We couldn't go into the nursing home, right? And at the very end, Mabel was allowed to go in. But I remember he had, six he had six children, and all six were outside in the courtyard. We had, they had masks on. Their spouses may or may not have been here. And, uh, but in most, for most cases, I think they were. And we were out in the courtyard, and I showed up, and I had my mask on, and went up to the window where Myers is inside this room. Mabel's inside, and 
called up on the telephone, talked to him, the family was clustered over here, and I just thought, gee, this is a terrible way to die. And then we had a, we had a, and, and, and I, he didn't necessarily die of COVID. The people I'm going to describe didn't all die of COVID. It's just that this is the way we behaved this past year. And I'm not saying it was wrong to behave that way. I'm not making a judgment about that. I'm just saying it was painful. The other memory I have of this year regarding funerals and deaths and things like that was the funeral of Vernon Stoop. Vernon Stoop, if you don't know it, was a pastor for 75 years in a church outside of Boyertown. And he had some prominence uh, within our denomination at the time. And Vernon had this pastor cell group. So pastors came from different areas, went down, just hung out with Vernon every first Monday of the month from 9 to 12. And when I first became a pastor, I wanted to rub shoulders with people that had experience beyond my own. And I would every first Monday of the month go down and be with Vernon and these other pastors and just capture whatever wisdom I could get from them. And Vernon was traveling at the time, and so he went to conferences across the country, and he'd come back, and he had rich ideas practically every month that stimulated me. It was just really a blessing. And then when Vernon died, as people in this room know, <coughs> some of you know, he joined our church, and he drove 45 minutes or whatever, an hour, to come up here to worship with us and to be a leader in our church. And he was like an unpaid assistant pastor for me. He was just a great and then when Vernon died, I looked this morning, I think I did his funeral on April 14, 2020. That was in the beginning of this. There was only 10 people allowed to be at that funeral outside in a cemetery, and we all wore masks, the undertaker. It was just, if Vernon, had, and he was in his 90s, so less people would have come. I know that the older you live, the, lo- the less of your contemporaries are still here, I get that, but there would have been a lot of people from our church that would have gone to that funeral, would have loved to be at that funeral. It's just like, this isn't right. You know, this is, it, it's so sad. And then sometimes families would say, well, well, we'll have another funeral service later, but I mean, it's still not quite over here. And it, it just seemed uh, strange to me. There's a scripture that says in Romans 12, verse 15, that we should be happy with those who are happy and weep with those who weep. And my reflection was, if your loved one died in the last week, no matter what their age, there'd be an edge of emotion to the service. There really would be emotion here because it's a loss that's very vivid, very real, somewhat intense. But when your loved one has died a year, a year and a half, two years ago, it's a different kind of emotion that you experience. You still miss the person. My father died in May of 2019, before COVID, and I'm kind of glad he didn't live to experience COVID in that respect, but uh, it's a different emotion. And you begin to, maybe you think this way, maybe you don't, but you begin to remember the person. You get beyond the emotions that you remember experiences that you shared with the person. You, you think about, things that they may have taught you depending on the nature of your relationship with the person. Or you might, in my case, think about how I'm similar or dissimilar to my father, that kind of thing. And, and really, I think we begin to reflect on how the person impacted us. How did they impact us? How did they make a difference? So when I was writing a sermon two months ago or so, I put out on Facebook, Tell me about somebody that's died in the last year or two that's impacted your life and how did they impact you? And I got a variety of responses. And what I want to do, when I do funerals normally, I will go out often in the crowd with a microphone and I'll say, tell me about the person who died. Well, we're, we're here, some of us are here at least, to reflect on a particular person. And so they're all random statements. So I thought, I'm going to take these statements from Facebook and they kind of apply to you, too. They're, they're the things that these people reflected on are similar maybe to some of the things you might reflect on in your life. And then we're going to look at your pictures that you've submitted. So there's a person who happens to be married to a cousin of mine who wrote that he lost his cousin to COVID, and he was the best cousin I could have ever had. 
Some of us have lost cousins. Another person wrote that she had lost her grandmother, and then she reflects on her grandmother. And she says that my grandmother taught me how to cook and bake, and we played card games together. Does this similar to your, sound similar to your grandmother? Sometimes we'd go to breakfast or lunch, and she was there if I needed advice. And I had a car accident in November of 2005, and she took me in for a short time when I was limited. And we used to go on beach trips. Does that sound like somebody maybe that's a part of your life? And then somebody else, as, it, as it is the nature of Facebook, said, I remember your grandmother. I went on beach trips with your grandmother. There's another person that wrote, my father-in-law, my stepdaughters, great-grandmother, and two aunts. All were very special people. They all died in this past year and a half or whatever. Each had a huge heart and most loved the Lord very much. And three passed from COVID. I'm not going to mention how everybody died, but like three out of these four people died from COVID. It's horrible. There's a college friend of mine who wrote, I lost Estelle, the mother of a very good friend. And Estelle, this older woman, whoever she is, became very meaningful to my college friend. And he writes of Estelle that she was a light to our world. Strong, engaging, gracious, witty, and at ease with her life. And she reminded me of my own mom. Somebody else wrote that they lost their cousin. And he liked to race his car, hang out with the family. I didn't clarify this. Did he like to race his car on the road <laughs> illegally, or did he race in a racetrack? I don't know that part. But it just says he liked to race his car. Somebody in our church mentioned Vernon Stoop and how much a blessing he was, and then somebody else tagged on and said, I loved his words of wisdom and his joy for life. Somebody else in our church mentioned Lee Wagenseller. Does anybody in this room remember Lee Wagenseller? That's one person. She was 95, 96. That's just one person. I miss you know, lots of these people, but uh, that's one person I really miss. Lee Wagenseller. This person wrote, she was a very classy lady and devoted to God. Um, somebody else wrote that uh, my uncle passed away at the end of 20. Still doesn't feel real. Somebody else wrote, my boyfriend's stepmom and father died and... She, she writes that she enjoyed Saturday, Sunday night dinners with them, and she herself had lost her parents years earlier. And so these were surrogate parents. Somebody else wrote how her husband died of, of uh, COVID after 43 years of marriage, and he was compassionate, caring, and loving. Somebody else wrote about her friend who died, uh, who she spent time shopping and playing cards and going to bingo or just sitting and talking, and she always brightened my day. Somebody else wrote, my husband passed away in September when I was 27 weeks pregnant with our third child. I miss laughing with him, his amazing cooking, and watching him play with our kids, and I despise that he wasn't here to know our youngest. Those are memories. Those are reflections. Those are words, a bit of legacy. So what I want to do now is take a time to look at uh, some pictures, and you'll have to bear with me. I'm going I'm to say their name, and then I'm going to say at least one relationship so we have a reference point as to who these people are, as I don't know all these people, as you surely won't. But why don't we show those, those pictures in the screen now? And, and while we do... I want you to reflect what was this person's legacy for you? What memories do you share with this person? And uh, some of these pictures, I'm going to admit, have, uh, are pictures of people who actually died before COVID. We just, we got whatever picture we got, we took and we put on the screen. So they're not all people that have died in the last year and a half. The first person is out of Fern Adam. She's Yvonne's, Yvonne's mother and married to Harold, and Harold's the next picture. And they, they died before COVID. Ooh, slow down a little bit. Um, yeah, I don't want to say anything more about Harold. Could, but won't. <laughs> now Myers, yes. Myers is Harold's brother. Miles, Myers did die in the last year and a half or so. And his family is the one that I referred to being here earlier. Um, 
So Myers died. The next person's picture is Richard Berger. And this is Scott Reichert's best friend. This is Scott's friend. Died in the last year and a half. Next photo is that of Marvin Brandstatter. Marvin died and he leaves behind his wife Cindy and Marvin and CJ are his children. And then Dorothy Burkert died uh, in the last year and a half. And she, uh, she's the mother of Janine Bayshore, whose husband Bruce is sick with COVID right now. Next picture is Dawn Christman. And she died before COVID, I think, and uh, is married, was married to Earl and had Connie and Kelly as daughters. Next person is uh, Jacqueline Cooper. This is Amy Miller's grandmother. Amy Miller is the daughter of Jeff Miller, Jeff and Beth. This is Amy's grandmother. I, ma I married Jeff and Beth, and I remember meeting that woman, Jacqueline. Wouldn't have known her name. Betty Dreibelbus died this past year. Betty's the sister of Wayne Chappelle. Betty used to sit in the back corner of the church when she came. The last couple of years, she hasn't been coming anymore, but Betty died in the last year. Next picture is Glenn Ebling. You may not know him. Well, I didn't know him. Probably most of us didn't know him. They lived at Crispin Lake, and he's married to, um, oh my goodness, my mind blanked all of a sudden. Karen, Karen, yeah. Karen started coming to our church because of grief care, grief share, and he died, I think, in August of last year, and she started coming, got very involved, and it's filled her. So we grieve his death. Gloria Gerhardt is the next person. Gloria died the past year. F friend of Dennis, friend of us, sang in the choir. Ah, I miss Gloria. Next person is Ruby Hefner. And Ruby is uh, the aunt, the aunt of Steph Reichert and of Miss Missy Koenig and other people, but that's Ruby Hefner. And then Michael Hill. Michael Hill is Vesta Porter's ex-brother-in-law. And she submitted that picture. It must have remained close. The next picture is that of Leroy Hoffman. Leroy Hoffman's Diane and Barbara's uh, father. And there he is picking tomatoes. He was, we used to be the general manager at um, Red Cheek. Uh, and, and then in his retirement years, planted a boatload of tomatoes and sold them to Farmers Brown and then went to Good Stand Produce Market and did the same thing. Very enterprising and died just a couple of days shy of 100. Sam Kistler is the, was the husband of, Denise, uh, of uh, Bernice Kistler. And he died this year. Arlington Klein often came to this worship service He's married to Emma, and I've found out subsequently he's had a number of nicknames. I knew he was nicknamed Skip, but oh, shucks, now I forget the other name she, she calls him. It's like, just, I never even knew that was his nickname, so he had a couple. Never mind, I can't go on about everybody. Next picture is Dave Landis. I don't know him, and yet I communicated every week. During COVID, he started listening to our church services online. He was dying of cancer, and he's a friend of Ernie Kramer's, hunting buddy, impacted Ernie spiritually, and he lived in Tennessee, and we emailed back and forth when he reacted to sermons, and we talked, and I talked as his death got closer to him via email and occasionally letters, uh, phone calls. Louise Mangle is the next one, married to Carl. This kills me that the you know, last time I saw Louise in, in this church, you know, it was before, just sad that you can't, that's where it ends. But we grieve Louise's death. And what a husband Carl was, wasn't he? Didn't we all admire Carl's husbandly care of Louise as she uh, failed in health? And Wayne Mengel. Wayne Mengel's Mylan's brother and a bunch of us. Uh, Kevin Mengel cleans the church. He's his uncle. And there's other people that are siblings of Wayne's. I think there was 10 in the family at some point, and now there's four remaining siblings. And then Carl Miller. 
pretty sure Carl died before COVID, but somebody s submitted his picture, and it's nice to remember him. Married to uh, Marilyn and Elaine Miller, sister of Faye and Lucy. Wow, that's a younger picture of Elaine. But uh, Elaine died in the last year. And Carl Schrader uh, is Monty's father, and he died probably before COVID, I think, I think. And then Elton and Esther Seidel. Elt, uh, Esther is the sister of Harold Durr and, and married to Elton. I used to give them home communion for years because they were you know, de in declining age and health. And then these pictures were submit submitted by Cindy uh, Moyer because I, I didn't know it, but they were aunt and uncle to her. I didn't realize that. There's another person, Marie Simon. That's Sally James's stepsister. I remember uh, Sally calling me up when her sister died, just really upset about that loss. Vernon Stone is Vesta Porter's brother, and he died over the course of the past year. And then Vernon Stoop, who I mentioned earlier, the pastor, that's Vernon. And he has two children, um, Valerie and Brad, and his secretary, Janet Smithson, some of us came to know. And, she grieves his loss as well. And Barry Unger is Lucy, Lucy Unger's husband, and he died over the last year. And there's Lee Wagonseller's name. She's just an affectionate person. I miss her. Troy Wheeland. This is Dan Smith's second cousin, Dingo. This is his nickname, uh, Dan Smith's nickname. His cousin died. And that's the last of the pictures I have. And uh, when we look at those pictures, I hope you were thinking about your loved one, if you, if you have a loved one that was represented up there, or um, somebody, uh, you know, some reflection of those per people. What I really think of, when I think of these people, now it's a year later from these people who have died, is the legacy they've left. When you approach the end of your life, I think at least, you want to have some impact on others. You, you want to think that uh, you touch their lives in some way. And that's true not just for us, it's also true for Jesus. So listen to what Jesus says in the scripture in, uh, in the Great Commission. He says, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teach them teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I've given you. And that line, teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I've given you, is the one that stands out for me. Teach them. Jesus is saying, hey, I've, I've taught you this stuff. I hope this stuff continues. I, I want it to continue. That's, that's a desire for a legacy. So when I reflect about my dad, my mom died years ago, when my dad died more recently, I could say a lot about my dad. But I thought about a couple things that I wanted to mention here, just two. One, my father's, in my opinion, first thought, personal thought of God was in his childhood. He, he was born in the, barn in the farmhouse where he lived on the burnville Charlottesville Road, off the burnville Charlottesville Road. And one night, he told me, he was in bed. It was the summertime, and... Sometimes he shared a bed with two other brothers, but you know, he was in his bed, second floor, and he was laying back in his bed, full moon, the screen was there, and the, the, the light of the moon was coming through the screen, it was filtered with the grid of the screen, and my father saw a cross. That was the first time he thought of God in a real, whoa, God is real. The first time, God is real. He shared that with me one time. Another time, we were working on wood together, and I mentioned over the years that I do woodworking because my father became so skilled at doing crafts, you know, wood crafts and stuff, and cabinetry and things like that. So when I was here at the church 25 years, I thought, I better get a life. And I went to my father and said, Dad, teach me everything you have, know about woodworking. You have one week to do it. And um, we spent time together. I learned everything and more that he had. I'm better than him, of course. <laughs> And uh, I remember one time we were working on a wood project together. And I remember him saying, because you want to, with cabinetry, maybe, maybe something else is not as precise, but when, when you want to make something 
really good, it's, it needs to be square. Because if this isn't square, it gets worse and worse, and the, the, the mistake magnifies itself. And we were trying to get, you know, I'm trying to get this really perfectly straight, perfectly square, squared off and so on. And my father said to me, he learned at some point along the way that you can't, you never can make it completely perfect. There's only one who is perfect. There's only one who's perfect. And here I am, I'm an adult, and my father, who's 75 or whatever, is trying to touch me and leave well, he didn't say, you know what, I'm going to make this statement, I'm going to leave a legacy. But he was leaving a legacy. I mentioned before how this summer, my favorite vacation, f for years, my favorite vacation was this summer when I went, had a tree cut down my backyard, I was ch sawing, chainsawing it up and asked my grandsons to help me clean up the mess, and then they helped, they, I said, why don't we spend a week of vacation together, and we went to my daughter Erin's house, and we cleared a path through the woods, a quarter mile long, 15, 20 feet wide, so they could play games in this woods, and I've told you that before. When I was preparing for that trip, Deanna said the same thing that I had already been thinking. Why don't I, why don't I have some devotions while we're doing this, at breakfast or lunch or something with my grandsons? Why don't I have devotions? And you know, if you want to leave a legacy, you can't be all fun and games. My grandchildren define me as fun and games. That's how they see me. Like when we have ice cream, I, I always serve the ice cream because years ago I used to work in an ice cream store, so I'm a pro at that. And I'd take the scoop, but their bowl is here. I'd never just put it in the bowl. That's way too boring. I always serve their ice cream by taking it, dropping, dropping it down in the dish. And sometimes it hits the dish, Sometimes it doesn't hitch the dish. It's all a win-win. It's all good, you know, it's good. I get the reaction I crave and it's all good. Sometimes I stand on my chair and drop it from that height and just drop it down. That's what I do. And, when I, and so my grandchildren will think of me as a person to drop the ice cream from a height or colored, you know, got the purple mohawk a couple years ago, or they'll think of me as a little Randy here. And sometimes, your family can think of you only in terms of he or she was always at my baseball or soccer games and that kind of thing. And sometimes you need to share a little bit of your inner self, which we tend to neglect to do. So when I was cutting those trees down with my grandsons, that was the reason I wanted to do these devotions. I picked out some scriptures that I thought would be relevant, not too long, that would bore them to death, that they'd start rolling their eyes just short enough to have an impact that would be appropriate for where they're at in their life as an 11 and a 13 year old. And I prayed with them, tried to engage with them over lunch. And on Friday of that week, Jonathan the older was in the house and Jacob the younger was out with me and we were eating lunch together and Jacob said to me at one point, Gramps, this is the biggest project I've ever done in my life. That was my favorite part of the whole week. Because it was an experience that long after I'm gone, they will remember. We're talking about legacies here. You know, leaving a legacy. And don't forget that the legacy includes not just the memories of teaching you how to cook and making games or whatever, it's, it's about pouring out of your inner self. And you see that in Jesus. There were memories for Jesus that were cherished, fun, wonderful, exciting, novel, different, but there were a lot of memories where he was pouring out his inner self. I think about a fishing experience that Jesus shared with the disciples where he was standing on the shoreline. They hadn't caught anything all night long after his resurrection. He calls out to them, go throw your nets on the other side of the boat. And they did, they caught fish and then they realized with Jesus, they came ashore and they're cooking fish. Think of this for a memory. Cooking fish over an open fire, sitting on some logs. And then Peter, Jesus moves from where he's positioned over next to Peter. And he whispers something to Peter. And he says, Peter, who denied knowing Jesus three times, he says to Peter, Peter, do you love me? And Peter says, yeah. I mean, that talk about, this is why we don't go to the personal and the inner self. When you say to somebody, do you love me? 
That's getting close to the heart of emotions. That's scary. That's why I'd rather drop ice cream from three feet up than go to the emotion. Because the emotion, maybe I lose it. I don't want to lose it. Do you want to lose it? No, I want to lose it. No, sometimes we need to go to the edge. Peter went to, Jesus went to the edge and he said, Peter, do you love me? And Peter said, you know I love you. He said, feed my sheep. You're still part of the team. I know you failed three times. You're still part of the team. I can still use you. I still love you. He denied, Peter denied Jesus three times. Jesus three times said, Peter, do you love me? Feed my sheep. Do you love me? Feed my sheep. Do you love me? Feed my sheep. That left an impression on Peter. That was a, that was a legacy moment for Jesus and Peter. There was a time when Jesus was in the upper room the night before he was killed. And he went around and he washed their feet. Very intimate. Very emotional. Because that was the job of the servant. And they were like, this, this, just this action, this physical action was like something that was very memorable for them. They would never forget the time when Jesus Christ, Son of God, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, washed their feet. But he didn't just do a physical action. You see, he pushed the envelope. He didn't just do something. He defined it with his words. Sometimes we do things, but don't define with the words what they mean. You go to the baseball game or the soccer game of your grandchild every single time they play a game, and you do that, and you're displaying your emotion of love and devotion to them, sometimes say to them, you, do you know why I'm going to your soccer games? you got to verbalize that. I'm going to your soccer games because you're the most precious thing in my life. Now, that's close to the edge of emotion, but that's why you do it, isn't it? Is it because you love watching first graders kicking a ball around as, as a bunch of ants? Is that true? No. You're there because you love them. Verbalize it. Because that's what Jesus does. So here he is. He's doing this amazing action. He's washing their feet. And then having washed their feet, he doesn't leave well enough alone. He verbalizes what it means. And this is what Jesus says. He goes right out there. It says, after washing their feet, he put his robe on again, sat down and asked, do you understand what I was doing? You call me teacher and Lord, and you're right, because that's what I am. And since I, your teacher and Lord, have washed your feet, you ought to wash each other's feet. I have given you an example to follow. Do as I have done to you. I love you guys. You matter. Love each other. That's what he was saying to them. And he put it out there, and we need to put it out there. So here's my question of the day. Here we go. You ready for the question? If this was, now we're thinking about your loved ones who have died, but we're also talk, I'm also talking to you. Here's your question. If this was the last week of your life, what would you do? What would you say? With whom would you spend your time? If this was the last week of your life, Keeping in mind the desire that I think most of us have to leave a legacy. What would you do? What would you say? With whom would you spend your time? Many of us would, would go to family. It might be, not be exclusively where we go, but many would go to family. And uh, the Apostle Paul, mentoring young Timothy, makes a family statement at one point. And he says this. Listen to what Paul says to Timothy uh, in, in the fifth cha- eighth verse and fifth chapter of 1 Timothy, he says this, those who won't care for their relatives, especially those in their own household, have denied the true faith such people are worse than unbelievers. Now you might say, whoa, what's this have to do with it? What's it saying? Just What's it saying on its surface? It's saying, I've got to financially take care of my family. If I have somebody in need within my family, I need to care for them. That's what it's saying. I don't think we're merely supposed to take care of our family financially. I think we need, when they're vulnerable, I think we need to take care of our family emotionally. This is your last week of life. What do you need to say to your children? 
This is the last week of your wife, life. What do you need to say to your spouse? This is the last week of your life. What do you need to do with that friend? It's the last week of your life. The last week of your life. There's no time to mess around anymore. I love you. I'm sorry. I forgive you. You matter to me. I'm proud of you. You've been a great father. You've been a wonderful mother. This is the last week of your life. It's more, it, it requires more than just dipping ice cream. It requires more than just actions. It requires words. Jesus didn't just act. He attached words. And those words are close to the edge of emotion. And maybe you'll lose it. So be it. Do you or do you not want to leave a legacy? That's what people will cherish after you're gone. There's one more thing you need to do. Last week of your life. Scripture says, take care of your family financially. I'm extrapolating and saying, take care of your family and those that you love, care about emotionally. I'm sorry, please forgive. I love you, and so on. One more thing. Take care of your family spirit, spiritually. Take care of your family spiritually. Share your faith with, the, with those people in your life. Take care of your family spiritually. You know already from the announcements that there's a guy in our church that's really sick right now. His name is Bruce Bayshore. I think he's about 65. I know he's going to retire at the end of this year. Married to Janine, has four children, Brad and Aaron and Whitney and Trisha. He went into the hospital about two weeks ago. It's gotten progressively worse needing more oxygen, and yesterday he went to, into intensive care unit, and for the first time his family could see him since they'd been in the hospital through a window into intensive care. I was with them and prayed with them. At some point this past week, they had a family conversation, and I've asked Janine for permission to share this story. Family conversation through FaceTime, through the computer. Bruce was with Janine via FaceTime and Brad and Aaron and Whitney and Trisha all together. And it was one of those times when Bruce, unlike us, has considered the very real possibility, which I hope is not true, that this could be his last week. He's living in that place right now. And he wanted to say something to his family. He knew that he needed to care for them emotionally. And in that conversation that they had, he shared his heart with them. He expressed whatever he felt he needed to express, and they expressed to him whatever they felt they needed to express. And guess what? It was emotional, I'm sure. But there was one thing that Bruce said that he declared mattered more to him than taking care of his family emotionally. And that was taking care of his family spiritually. And Bruce put out there, Janine said to me yes, someday this week, Bruce put out there, this is what matters most of all to me above all else. This is what really matters to me. He said, I want you kids to be completely right with Jesus Christ. That matters to me more than anything else I could ever express. He said, I know that you, you have each invited Jesus into your life at some point. But I just, I just need to know it's real. And you're really going to live with Jesus forever. I want to see you again one day. And I want to know that you're really, truly, authentically, sincerely pursuing Jesus and living in Jesus and loving Jesus. And I need to, he said. Talk about going to the edge. 
He said, I need to hear you say, all of you say with me, the salvation prayer. I want to hear the words coming from your lips. I want to know that you're going where I hope you go. Please, he said to his family, as they obliged with, I'm sure, emotion, pray with me. God, thank you for loving me. I know and admit that I've sinned. And I believe, I know that Jesus has died on the cross for the forgiveness of my sins. And I invite you into my life to take over and live and reign within me. And all of the family, through the FaceTime experience, prayed that prayer together. Because that, of all the things that Bruce is thinking about right now, in the situation and circumstance he is in, is in his life, that is the singular thing that matters most to him. And it's the thing that matters most to those people that were on that screen. Because those people, from where they are currently sitting, cares about that one thing more than anything else. Every one of them, without exception, would be asking, encouraging, pleading with you to be right with God now because one day it's your turn. Because you know what I and my brother both thought when my father died, having had my mother die back in 1997. What did we think? There goes that generation. We're next. Have you ever thought that? Of course you have. Of course you have. And so the persons that we saw on the screen are saying the same thing that Bruce was saying to his family this week. Please be right with God through Jesus Christ and pray the prayer of salvation and pursue him each and every day until you take your last breath. That's what Bruce said to his family, and they prayed, and I assure you, there was emotion. And then Bruce's son, Aaron, said, Dad, at some point, I didn't know the sequence, Dad, can I pray? And that son prayed for the family. How does that impact a father? To have your son pray when your greatest desire of your life is for your family to embrace a faith. How does it impact you as a father to hear your, fa your son stepping up and praying a real heartfelt prayer to the Lord? That blesses. That blesses you. Bruce was making an effort to leave a legacy. And Bruce would be pleased if he knew, and he possibly will, he'll know, maybe he'll listen to this message, maybe not. Bruce would be pleased with me preaching this message. Because we are called by Jesus not just to leave a legacy in the lives of our children, but in the lives of everyone in whom we, with whom we come in contact. Because Jesus' very last words in the God, book of Acts, first chapter, the eighth verse says that we should be witnesses for him in Judea, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. We need to think about leaving a legacy. So here's the question. How would you live your life? What would you say? What would you do? With whom would you spend your time if you knew that this was your last week? What would you do? What would you say? With whom would you spend your time if this was your last week? And then one more question. What's stopping you from doing that now? Why wait until your last week to say I love you? Why wait until your last week to say I'm sorry? Why wait until your last week to say I forgive you? Why wait until your last week to say I'm proud of you? You matter to me. I cherish you. Why wait until your last week to say, I hope you share the faith in Jesus Christ that I have? Because Jesus is the greatest thing that's a part of my life, and I want for you to share it too. Why not do it now, express it now, share it now, rather than wait for that last week? The time to begin to leave a legacy is now.
Let me pray. Lord God, I ask that you would touch us and move in us by the power of your Holy Spirit to live as you want and let every day count. Thank you for leaving the legacy of love in our own lives. It's ultimately from you. And I pray that you'd help us to leave a legacy in the lives of others that matters. In your name we pray. Amen. Let's sing together hymn number 586, Teach Me Thy Way, O Lord. pray together. Lord God, we do ask that you would be at work in the lives of people who need your touch. We pray for Richard Atkinson. He has a cancerous experience in his life. We pray for healing for him. Kelly Clark's mother and stepfather have COVID also. Dealing with that, I saw that out there. Pray for them. But right now my heart is most focused on Bruce because he's in a serious situation. And I pray in your name that you would intervene, that you would bring healing to him by the power of your Holy Spirit. I've seen you touch the lives of people before, and I pray if it would be your will at all, and we plead that it would, you would be so gracious and give him the gift of healing in his life. Restore him to his health. Bless him and Janine and uh, his sons and daughters. Comfort them and give them your hope and your blessing. And all those others that that prayer represents, we pray that you would be working in all those lives because I can't bring together other people that I should be praying for right now. We just lump them together with that prayer and ask that you would be at work. And I plead with you, please heal him. Now hear us as we pray the prayer that your son taught us when he said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts 
as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. This time, let's sing our concluding hymn for all the saints, 751. Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forevermore, world without end. Amen. Amen.